live from the College Football Hall of Fame here at day two of SEC Media Days. David Nuno went to lunch, so it's me here to host. I was here yesterday, but now I'm actually like important. I'm not just kind of here. So on the rewind, I'm going to leave it all up to Sam. I have no idea what we got coming, but I know what we're talking about. It's college football. I bet you hear from Connor O'Gara, Tony Barnhart, maybe Owen Buchanan, Billy Lucci. Who knows? We had it all. Peter Burns, maybe. It's probably all going to be here. This is the Texas Rewind presented by T-Mobile. Mm. Nick Saban today says if we do move towards a mega conference, the whole thing about competitive balance is going to be in question. If we have two 20-team leagues, how is that going to impact all of those teams that aren't in those leagues? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I don't even know what that means. Um, I agree with a lot of what Saban says, his concerns for everything, but I also think he talks out both sides of his mouth often. Um, it's easy to do. He start kind of in, in, He kind of – tapped into that today when he's talking about how the the Bama players made over three million dollars but you know this mythical number that he's got that a and made then that then that's you know something worth you know striking fear into everybody about and he says we're one of the haves our guys made three million but then he's worried about the have nots no you're really not um what you're saying is accurate makes sense but you don't care about the have-nots you can you you're you're the ultimate have right now and just like with nil i think they've been doing nil there in tuscaloosa for a long long time yep. like kind of the joke jimbo made at the very beginning and hell who knows maybe nick was one of the very people he was talking about but i i think saban is right about Let's figure this out on the recruiting level. And the one thing he said that really strikes me, because I keep hearing it and seeing it around the country, is these promises are being made by people that a lot of instances don't even know if they can live up to that in terms of paying these guys out. And it's almost like certainly they're going to have a hard time doing it over the course of a three- and four-year career as, as more and more of these guys are getting these deals. And then you also don't know – I know the people at A&M that, that are involved at the higher levels of these collectives, and they are uh, successful, proven businessmen, good people. They're not, they're not going to you know, do wrong by anyone in their, in their, or their families. Now, there's going to be the agents they have to fight that are going to come back with, with different promises that they shouldn't. There he is, Jake Crane, the crane, the craniac. The craniac. But – they're going to come with the, you know, and start trying to change the deal at the finish line. That, that's the other problem you're going to have with these kids that anytime you get flustered or your agent says, <clears throat> you don't need to make $150,000 a year. You need to make three hundred, dollars or if you don't, you need to transfer. Well, then just tell them that they didn't live up to the deal. Right. You're going to have kids doing that everywhere. You're already starting to see it, and, and it's going to make each individual school – like it's going to happen, uh, you know, in Norman, Oklahoma, and everyone in Austin and College Station, ooh, look at that. They'll never get another player again, and ki- it's going to be a negative for kids. But then it's also going to happen right after that in Baton Rouge, in College Station, in Austin. Everybody's going to have that happen. It's going to be a problem. All right, so why Arkansas 2 and not A&M in the uh, SEC West? All right, I – we, we it took us what ten six minutes six minutes to get to this point in the interview. I I think A and M is going to be the most overrated team in college football coming into this year. And before everybody <laughs> says who is this idiot, why do you have him on your airways? I am not an A and M hater. I'm not. I'm not. Even Billy was saying how A and M number four coming into the year that's too much. Yeah, it's too much for this team with all they lost in the front seven, with what they lost in Mike Elko, who I think is better at his job than DJ Durkin is. I, I, if I'm proven wrong on that, I will fully admit to it. With the questions that we have about the quarterback situation, which is still a relative unknown, even if you think Haynes King is going to be the guy, I said he was going to be the biggest X factor in the SEC coming into college football last year before he got hurt, but he's still an unknown. Max Johnson's still a relative unknown, despite the fact that he had the most casual 27 to 6 TD die and T ratio in the history of college football last year. I still think that we're we're at a different place with A&M compared to what we would typically look at with a number four team in the country. So I gave Arkansas more love because I think what Arkansas has been able to do with Sam Pittman and to build this program up 
in the first two years has been darn impressive. And I know what they have in KJ Jefferson at quarterback. I know what they have in that defense, returning Jalen Catalan, returning bumper pool, adding a former five-star Drew Sanders to fix that much needed area of edge rusher for that team. And I love the way that they address that. They're probably going to have the number one or the number two rushing attack in the SEC. They had the number one rushing attack in the SEC last year. So I look at all those things and the fact that, oh, by the way, they got over the AM hump. That was huge for that program. To win that game in Arlington was massive. So I look at all those different factors, and I'd say, give me Arkansas with a very, very slight edge. But the West is going to be all over the place, and that's why we're talking about who's going to be second place in the West because there are a lot of different arguments that you can make. Because you could say that third team in the West could still be a 10-win team. Easily. Yeah. I mean, it, last year, well, no, Ole Miss, I guess, technically was, was second, second in, in, the, West, in yeah. the West. But, yeah, I mean, they're all kind of sitting right there, and they're all going to be competing for New Year's Six Bowls. There could be four teams in the West competing for New Year's Six Bowls in November. Let me let you, get, let you know what the A&M fan thinks, or at least what us inside think. The difference, and I don't know if second, third, first, I don't know, because there are a lot of unknowns, but there are a lot of unknowns all over the West. I mean, there's yeah. unknowns that Ole Miss. I think Arkansas lost some people, too. I mean, you don't just replace Traylon Burks with whomever, right? 100%. Um, do you think Zach Calzado was good last year? I think he was good against Alabama. Exactly, right? All those games came down to the fourth quarter with above average. I'm not saying Bryce Young quarterback play. They win a couple of those games. The Mississippi State game, they win if they have quarterback play. The Arkansas game, they don't fall behind 20-0 to or 17-0 in the first quarter if they have average quarterback play. Here's the problem. They're going to have a top three defense in college football this year because they I, did last year. I think they're going to have a top 15 defense. I do. I do. I, I think that defense was underappreciated. I, I think we will look back on the 2021 A&M defense with the star power that they had and say, man, how did that team only go 4-4 four and four in SEC play? That's going to be maybe one of the, the big frustrations for AM fans moving forward. And not just because I think a lot of those guys are going to be really good on Sundays, but because I think they're going to look back at the body of work that they put together and how good they were against SEC competition. They're going to say, man, we had a golden opportunity. I saw in your, one of your most recent pieces, there's a, a time that Nick Saban brought his dog to media days. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It, it, the SEC media, you know, last year when, when Texas and uh, we found out that Texas and Oklahoma were coming right in the middle of media days, boy, nothing like this has ever happened. In, oh, oh, yeah, let me, let me give you a list. And one of them, I forget exactly what the year, Nick Saban was at LSU. He and uh, Miss Terry had come, and they brought their dog with them, and the dog was in the, was in the room. Somehow the, the maids let the dog out of the room, and the dog ran there, and somehow – he found Nick Saban right. speaking in the in the main media ballroom. Oh, wow. told that, and uh, it just that was just funny. But between that and the the year that Philip Fulmer got a subpoena when he showed up, that, that is oh that happened. Oh, one year Philip Fulmer, Philip Fulmer, there was this big. You have to go back and look it up now. It's been a while, but big conflict between the University of Tennessee and the University of Alabama, and folks in Alabama were not happy with Philip Fulmer and threatened to sue him and all this kind of stuff. So one year. So as not to get a subpoena, he did it on speakerphone. And we just were hurled around the right. speakerphone listening to, uh, to Philip Fulmer. And then the next year or soon after, whenever it was, the guy showed up with the subpoena and served him right at SEC meeting. Oh, days. wow. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That is, that, is, that is phenomenal. So we're at day two, and nothing major has broken yet, Tony. Well, nothing major has broken yet. I, I do think it was Commissioner Sankey's remarks yesterday – it was funny, somebody before it, because I've been here a million times, well, what's Commissioner Sankey going to say? I said, well, I think he's going to say two things. He's going to walk up and go, conference expansion? No, we're good. Thanks, we're good. Don't, don't worry about it. And the other thing he's gonna, he was going to say is, you know, it's pretty good to be us. And it is. It is. It is. The, the, the SEC is in a great, uh, great position right now. They don't need to expand. We're getting reports today that Notre Dame has made up their mind and they're not going to join the Big Ten. They've got okay. a financial package. I, I haven't confirmed that, but I've been told that is – and if that is true, then to me, uh, all eyes are on the Big 12. But the SEC – the only way the SEC makes a move is if Notre Dame goes to the Big Ten. Now, okay. now you've got to have a conversation right? Cause, because the numbers would be pretty, pretty big between that. By adding Notre Dame, if Notre Dame's not going, 
there is, to me, there is absolutely no reason for the SEC to add any more teams. So the, no interest in the Arizona schools, Miami, Florida State. You don't need to. Well, no, I don't think so. I, I think I think the the news broke today. Pete Thamel broke the news today that the Big Ten, the Big Twelve, and the Pac twelve, who had a flirtation with each other, have broken up, and they're not they're not going to do any kind of a partnership. Uh, dare we say alliance together? Uh, so what does that mean then? Do they well, steal some of the teams? I think what it means, the new commissioner of the Big 12 said, said last week that the Big 12 was open for business. And I think that what that means, if I am the Pac-12, I am watching my flank because yeah. they're coming after some of my teams. Uh, the big storylines, conference expansion, yada, yada, yada. Today I was speaking to some folks and they're like, slow down when it comes to the SEC. What do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I, like, you know, Commissioner Sankey just spoke a couple of minutes ago, and I think it's a fair point, right? Like, you're, you're in a position of power. Like, you don't have to make moves. Every one of these other conferences are making moves to get to the point of the SEC. Even the great ballyhooed Big Ten, who, you know, everybody believes it's, you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread. Guess what? They've won, you know, one different Big Ten team has won a championship since 1997, right. right? I mean, we've had three different teams in this conference within the last three years. So even the Big Ten, as great as they are, they're making moves because they're trying to compete with the SEC. And, and frankly, I love it because that means you must be doing something right as a conference if everybody's trying to make those moves. But, I mean, David, the idea of, of making, like, oh, let's go grab this team, go, go grab this team, why? Like... That's the one thing I'd really, or one of the things I really like about Greg Sankey is I don't ever feel like he's making he, he, out, of, out of like reactive decisions. I think that he's very calm and collected and goes, okay, let's just chill. He told us a story today about when UCLA and USC, he found out the news that they were joining the Big Ten. He purposely waited six days to call all of his athletic directors and get them on a meeting. Because he goes, I knew what was going to happen. If I got everybody on a conference call that next day, it would be this news story that Greg Sankey has gotten all of these athletic right. directors and people would be freaking out. He goes, we don't have to make moves. We can let the dust settle and let things play out as opposed to other conferences having to be aggressive to get back on the SEC level. I want to ask you how your fanhood has changed since you got to the SEC network because I find you to be mm. very... Uh, neutral. Uh, I know you love LSU, right? But, no but when you report, you really report the strengths and the weaknesses of all teams equally. So because of that, and knowing how passionate college football is, yeah. how that has kind of evolved in that role. It, it, it kind of stinks to a certain extent because I used to live, breathe, eat, sleep, every single thing LSU related. Like I was on a message board. I was, you know, talking to neighbors. I was trying, you know, recruiting classes of eighth graders. I mean, I was all in. And you know how it is, like the more you cover something uh, as, a, as a sport, the more you kind of take a step back and now you start realizing all the different storylines. And I used to hate every single school that wasn't SEC or LSU related. And then all of a sudden, I marry an Alabama girl. All right, that whittles it down. And then I go out there and I spend time with the Tex Ags family and I'm like, well, damn, I like a and I like now, those guys. Right? Yeah. Like, and you down to Florida and me and Chris Doring are boys. And, and then you get to meet these coaches and these players and you're like, well, wait a minute. I grew up thinking that this was the worst person in the human of the world, you know, ever. It's like A&M fans looking at Texas fans, right? right, right? right. And, and then you start realizing, you're like, well, wait a minute. Like, you know, your fandom is not as much, you're not as big of a fan, a sports fan, but you do pull for storylines, which is the big difference now. All right, that'll do it for the Tex Ags Rewind on a Tuesday. I'm Dalton Hughes. We'll be back here tomorrow from the College Football Hall of Fame for Tex Ags Radio. Be sure to check us out at texags.com for all content all day long. We got it. Thanks for watching.